one thing that we one thing that we do need to make sure about is that we follow what we call as the USP TSF guidelines in the USMLE exams. So anytime we have got any other guideline than this, which is the case with a lot of conditions, this is where we need to understand that we need to follow this particular one because there will be differences in the other guidelines. Also, whenever there is some question or there's anything that people want to ask, they can just raise their hands and they can open their mic and they can ask. And if something is confusing or anything like that, they can ask midway, so that's fine. So we'll begin with that. The first thing, the first uh, condition that we need to understand screening of is hypertension. All of this are screening guidelines. So all of this preventative care is about screening guidelines. We have excluded the pediatric screening uh, tests mostly because it is not that difficult and it's very short. So one can easily understand that. One thing I would like to recommend as well is the White Coat Companion, uh, which is a book that I highly vouch for. So if somebody has got a struggling time with any of this or e even the other step to CK content, they should check out that book. If it is benefiting them, then they should definitely use it more often. And if someone has access to resources like Amboss Library, that is something they should definitely check out for all of this stuff. This is primarily where I've based my presentation on. So hypertension, we do screen on every visit. This is something that you would not likely be asked as a screening test but uh, something we should know because it is just a vital measurement, right? So the, the, according to the guidelines, we don't really have a specific age group or any specific frequency with which we should evaluate hypertension. But one thing that they do like to test in the exams very often is that once they will give you hypertension, they will ask you about some routine tests. And these are the four ones that are listed here. The ECG, lipid profile, diabetes mellitus, and urine function. Tests. These are four tests that they will ask you on. So routine, in routine, regardless of any other risk factors, you need to do all of these four once you have got hypertension. And two of those things can be remembered very easily. I'll tell you how. Lipid profile and diabetes mellitus screen. This is something that is common between three, three disorders. We have got hypertension, we have got lipid profile, and we have got diabetes mellitus. Whenever we have got one of the three, we screen for the other two. This is what is very common between the three. So something I call as the similarity formula for memorizing stuff for step to CK. When you have got similar traits or similar features between particular pathologies or conditions, you just remember those. So with three of them, diabetes, hypertension, and lip dyslipidemia, all of these three are indicated when any of them are positive. So this is something we can always remember. And once we remember this similarity, it is pretty much easier to not forget or uh, this thing. The other two, ECG and urine function test, this is something we have to remember as a routine for hypertension. ECG primarily because of the effects of the heart and urine function tests because the, the kidneys may be a primary source. One thing that we read about hypertension very commonly is that hypertension is a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, what do we mean by diagnosis of exclusion is that we need to exclude the other pathologies, right? When we are coming to essential hypertension as a diagnosis. But this is something that we need to understand is that whenever we have got a diagnosis of exclusion that is extremely common or is the most common cause of out of all the other causes, for example, essential hypertension makes up like 85%. So whenever we have got such a scenario, we do not rule out the other pathologies with tests on every single case. This is why you do not see routine tests of thyroid profile. You do not see routine tests of parathyroid profile or adrenals or any other causes. So the diagnosis of exclusion does not mean that you rule out every other condition on every routine visit. Only when there is an indication, when the clinical scenario is suggestive of that particular condition, then you go for those tests. So for routine tests, th these four, not the others. So this is something that can commonly confuse us and we should remember that. So hypertension is done. I have actually put out each one of them as separate because if it, if you look it out in a chart, it may sound very confusing, but if you treat them separately, it, it gets easier. Also, when you are trying to remember this, once this presentation is done, obviously there will be lots of things that you will forget over time. So what I recommend is that whenever you're trying to remember any of these, always treat them as single entities first. First, try to remember each single entity. For example, we did hypertension. Try to remember the routine indications after hypertension in, in that scenario. Try to remember that as an isolation rather than all the screening guidelines at once. 
once we are done with everything once we are at the end once we are nearing our exams that's when we can refresh our memory and we can test uh, ourselves by going through all the screening at once but other than that test yourself separately now hyperlipidemia there are two timings of this test and both of these timings should be one should be aware of the first test is indicated between 70 to 21 years of age now this is something i have not seen get tested during my personal experience at least with amboss and uworld and the uh, other assessments and the actual exam but this is something that is a high yield concept that is mentioned everywhere we do screen the hyperlipidemia first time between 17 to 21 years of age so this is something we should remember it might come up on the exam the second time is the most important one the one that is commonly tested as you can see there are three different things written so what i would recommend is if one can remember then for men it is different for women it is different but if one just wants a simplified way which often serves us well is that we can remember that between 40 to 75 years of age we need to screen for hyperlipidemia in all individuals every five years right so this is all routine screening also like we discussed when we have got hypertension when we have got diabetes mellitus we need to uh, treat uh, screen for hyperlipidemia so there are really two indications here for the second test which is the most commonly tested ones every five years 40 to 75 years of age and for hyperlipidemia and uh, for diabetes mellitus and hypertension we should screen so that's it now diabetes mellitus we have to see now hypertension and diabetes are already sidelined that is something that i've already told you that we screen for diabetes mellitus is screened for between the ages of 35 to 70. now these age groups might get a little confusing at, at the start because there is some you know every every condition has got its own separate age group, but still there is some similarity for example this is also till the upper limit of 70 that one also is still the upper limit of 70. But the more important thing is that USPTSF guidelines recommend that only with BMI greater than 25, you go for this diabetes mellitus testing, right? You will find other guidelines, for example, the ADA guidelines, where not necessarily the overweight or the obesity criteria is there, but we have to remember this one. So between 35 and 70, this is something that they will ask and with the BMI greater than 25. And the screening frequency is slightly different from dyslipidemia. We screen for it every three years. The screening frequency is in particular not high yield for these conditions that is something i would like to mention but it is not really that tested as compared to the cancer screening when it comes to frequency but still if one can remember there's few conditions where the screening frequency is given so one should try to remember those five years for dyslipidemia and three years for diabetes mellitus and that is pretty much it about this condition as well there are three messages on chats okay osteoporosis now this is uh, again, a very commonly tested condition, very simple to remember. All that it needs to be done is the margin of 65. This is the age group above which it is recommended for all the women. So this is something that they ask always. There is an indication that is given in the guidelines for the ages 50 to 65. But this is with risk factors and a FRAX calculator. This is something that I've not seen asked or tested. So I would particularly suggest that you stay away from this number. This is something that you will not be able to either calculate and it will not be really asked. So greater than 65 is all you need to remember with the DEXA scan once. Now, what if a rare kind of a question comes up in your exam where they actually do test this somehow? For that kind of scenario, I always recommend that one has this approach of ruling out the other options. So if one has the ability to rule out very confidently the other options and if only this option is left for example the DEXA scan with the age of let's say 60 or 61 then you might think then also i would like to think that the risk factors there would be very very clearly mentioned they might have previous falls they might have a very strong family history they might have vitamin d deficiency and all that stuff so they will have to specify it very strongly for you to actually indicate uh, a DEXA scan in osteoporosis so this is something that they will commonly ask us, but this is something that they can ask. But the solution for that is what I think the rule out method, if one does not remember this and not indicated in men, unless there is a clear indication again, this is something that they will not ask for men. Uh, again, only when there is a severe picture given with a lot of risk factors, only then you should go for men. Otherwise, they will just test for women. Now, this is something that is different from the osteoporosis in a sense that they will never be tested about for females. Abdominal aortic aneurysms will always be tested about males. This is why I've bolded and capitalized this word. Even they will try to give you a confusing picture 
where they have this age group, where they have this ever smoking criteria. Now, what does this mean by ever smokers? It means that anyone has smoked at any point in their life, regardless if they have quit for like 30 years, 40 years, does not matter. Once they have smoked, once they have got a smoking history, you screen them. And that is done only once between 65 to 75 years of age. Again, the cutoff of 60, 65 is there, which is similar to osteoporosis for females. So you can remember the similarity between the two conditions, one for male, one for female, and both starting with the age of 65, both being done once. So that is a lot of similarities for one to remember. And uh, abdominal ultrasound, obviously, is the modality for that. DEXA was the modality for this one, the other one. So this condition is pretty much straightforward. Now, I have put all the lung cancer guidelines separately, except for this one. Lung cancer, has I have put separately because this is uh, what I wanted to share, another similarity for people to remember, uh, another difference, in fact, because sometimes there might be differences between two conditions that one finds easier to remember. Now, previously, we mentioned about abdominal aortic aneurysm and how it needs to be ever smokers. Somebody was ever smoked in their life. This is not the case for lung cancer. We have to have someone who has smoked in the last 15 years. That is the first criterion. And if that is not met, then the lung cancer screening is not done. It needs to be a greater than 20 year pack history and it needs to begin 40, 50 to years of age till 80. This is the age span and it is done with a low dose annual CT always, not a high dose. Obviously, we are doing it for screening purposes, but this is something that they confuse people in. They will give you a smoking history, but if it is not in the last 15 years, then it's not indicated in an indication for lung cancer screening. So one should always remember this and one should always remember the difference between this and the abdominal aortic aneurysm, where it needs to be just an ever smoker, one time smoker to fill in the criterion. Okay, so next, next come the sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, this is something again, high yield, and uh, we have a lot of conditions, but if we simplify them in groups, it's very, very easy. The first group is chlamydia and gonorrhea. This is, they will ask all the time, this is an animal testing that is indicated between uh, less than for a women less than 24 years of age. And it is always with the sexually active women. They might sometimes confuse you and give you an age group that is like 21, 22, but they will not give an a sexually, a sexually active woman. For that, you do not need to get, do, do this testing, obviously. So it is only for sexually active women till the age of 24 as well. It is not indicated greater than 24 years of age. This is only done with risk factors. Now, what are the risk factors that you can remember for greater than 24 years of age that is multiple sexual partners inconsistent protection use you know both these are primary risk factors somebody who has got a history of violence or prisoners or stuff like that somebody where sexually transmitted diseases may have a higher incidence so chlamydia and gonorrhea for greater than 24 in those patients as well now hiv is the next sexually transmitted disease and it is a one time screen between 18 to 79 this is something that is common for both men and women. Chlamydia and gonorrhea is not for men. Uh, when you have got chlamydia and gonorrhea, it's only tested with for women in routine screening. Does not mean that it does not affect males. Obviously, it does. But we, when we talk about routine screening, we do not have males fulfilling that criterion. HIV is, however, similar for both men and women. It is done between the ages of 18 to 79. This is an age group that needs to be remembered. And I will give you another similarity of how it can be remembered. And otherwise, it, it does uh, HIV, if there's a high risk of individual, for example, the same risk factors that I've told along with homosexual males and stuff like that, that HIV needs to be annually. But other than that, it is a one-time stream. Syphilis, again, only for high-risk individuals. Now, this is something that is not done routinely. We talked about HIV. We talked about chlamydia and gonorrhea being a routine test. Chlamydia and gonorrhea being routine for women less than 24 and HIV being a routine for 18 to 79 age groups, regardless of any risk factor. But other than that, syphilis is something that you only test for when there is a high risk individual. And again, the risk factors are the same as for the other sexually transmitted diseases. It is also done annually. And for men, these are the two that you test only when there are risk factors. Uh, HIV is all the, up outside the routine screening of one time for HIV for men. Uh, if there are risk factors, you do go for annual HIV and syphilis, not for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So this is something that is slightly different between women and men. And one should remember that. 
hepatitis B and C. Now, hepatitis C has got that common age bracket that we had for HIV. And this is something that we can remember as a similarity. Once again, there is a similarity that is common between two conditions. It's a one-time screen. Both are sexually transmissible, 18 to 79 years of age. And both are often heard of in the same context, hepatitis C and HIV. So hepatitis B, on the other hand, is not in a one-time screen. It is not indicated in a specific age group without risk factors. It is only indicated when you have got risk factors. So hepatitis B is different in that sense. And the risk factors, again, are pretty much those for any kind of hepatitis B. For example, IV drug abuse, multiple sexual partners, repeated blood transfusions, all of that. So that fulfills for hepatitis B. Now, one thing that... When we are doing routine screening, we always make sure that it is separate from other indications of those conditions. For example, hepatitis B and C have this other indication that they need to be tested whenever someone tests positive for HIV or whenever there is chronic lung disease. Those are separate. Hepatitis C has this indication that if, if someone has an ITP, they should be tested for hepatitis C. Those conditions are separate from routine screening. One should never think that these are con like the exclusive conditions so the indications, whatever we are discussing, these are not exclusive indications. So there needs to be an understanding of that concept. What is routine screening? What is a screening indicated after a certain condition tests positive? Okay, so now we come to cancers. This is something uh, even more challenging in a sense that they have got lots of guidelines. And uh, when done in a systematic way, when done in a way that we form our own tips and tricks around those things. We can easily remember them. For cervical cancer, this is something that is tested very heavily in women, obviously. Between the ages 21 to 29, we have got a PAP test only for three years. Now, this is again the USPTSF guidelines, the one that is tested above. We have got other guidelines where you would see that there is an age bracket till 24. Beyond 24, HPV testing is still indicated. But like that is a separate guideline for routine USPTSF guidelines. We separated easily 21 to 29 only PAP and HPV still has high false positive because of the high, uh, there's a very high chance that these individuals who are, who are sexually active in these ages, they, ha they will have HPV. So that is why we consider a PAP testing alone being more reliable. But above 30 years of age, and that is when we should adopt HPV. And that is when we should adopt it with PAP ideally, which is done five years, which is what we, what we call the core test. So if sometimes it is asked that if an individual is above 32, above 30, 31 or 32, maybe, or even more, if someone is that age, if they ask for a better test, it is always an HPV plus PAP test. The core test obviously has got better sensitivity. But after 65, the strain must stop. This is something, again, that the test, they will give you an age group that is after 65, and they would like you to know that the test should be stopped or not. Uh, they will definitely give you prior negative PAP test. Otherwise, there will be a positive history that you would likely consider. And there are some special scenarios here that I've written down. There is smokers. You can extend to 75, 80 years of age. This is not a very high yield thing. Not something that you really need to remember it. But if you want to, you can. All of these special scenarios, really, they're not something very uh, tested. Immunocompromise is an annual indication rather than the routine indication of the five years, but eventually you go for three-year testing in these individuals as well. A hysterectomy, obviously it's not needed unless there is a high-grade dysplasia previously, a CIN2. And a post-ablative, once we have treated for a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, that's when we test annually for two years before return, returning to normal screening. So these are other special scenarios outside the routine tests and if one wants to remember, they can remember that, but this is not something very high yield. The routine test is more high yield. Now, this is outside our domain of routine screening, but I thought to include, to include this because it is something that I think uh, one should understand because it may sound very confusing. But if you separate it like the way that it is shown in the slide, it can get easier. The first one, whenever you have got a pap smear showing you atypical glandular and endometrial cells, what do we do then? If there is an age group greater than 35, you will see this number very often in this in this particular question stem. If it is greater than 35, it's an indication of direct endometrial biopsy. But if it is less than 35, you go for an endometrial biopsy only if there are risk factors for endometrial CA, which means that there needs to be high estrogenic states, something like obesity, something like PCOS. So unless those 
risk factors are there a less than 35 year old woman is not having an endometrial biopsy in this scenario and they will, they will give you this scenario very often where they will give either the term glandular is used or endometrial is used the same thing the next thing is an atypical squamous cell of either high grade dysplasia or it is a high grade squamous uh, uh, intraepithelial lesion itself so when you have got these two conditions you have got direct corpus op so these two can be thought of together both are high grade it is as simple as that a high grade lesion whether it is for squam atypical squamous cells or whether it is a simple head cell it is a direct corpus op always the problem comes when you have got the other categories the other categories are when you have got a, a, a atypical squamous cells with undetermined significance and you have got a low grade lesion an l cell there we have two age groups and this is where all the confusion starts but if you remember the concept of hpv we talked about how hpv is more likely to be false positive in an individual less than 30 years of age and i talked about a guideline that has got a 24 cut off for the normal routine screening here we have got the us usptsf guidelines where the 24 cut off is not there for the routine screening but it does apply to that uh, knowledge of when do you test for what after you have got a particular abnormality so in a less than 24 year old woman you do not test for hpv because there is a very high risk of high false high false positive so either of those two conditions you test them the same way that is why they are in the same group but for a less than 24 years uh, old woman no hpv triage is done now why is this concept of triage because through hpv we are deciding whether we want to go for colposcopy or whether we do not want to go for colpus colposcopy if hpv is positive in an individual that is greater than 25 year old then we go for colposcopy but if it is negative then we can repeat the co test now the co testing repeating timing is different for the ascus and the lcl but not a high yield thing what they would like you to know more is the hpv positive status and they will like you to know that if the hpv is negative you repeat the co test it is as simple as that not necessarily the air frequency but uh, this is what the significance of hpv is and this is how it manages those two groups but what if what for the less 24 less than 24 years of age because hpv trials cannot be done we just repeat the co test directly we repeat cytology and if it remains abnormal then we go for colposcopy not the co test sorry we will not repeat the co test because hpv is not done here so only the cytology is repeated in one year of age and then if it is abnormal then we go for colposcopy because so i hope that this particular slide will help you separate those conditions we have to remember that the high grade lesions are for direct colposcopy we have to remember the concept of hpv triage and how does it apply to l cell and ascus for only people with less greater than 25 years of age and the less than 24 is a separate kind and lastly when you have got an hpv positive status but the pap test is negative this is when we have to repeat the co test again and it is done in one year so this is something that needs to be remembered separately a positive hpv but a negative pap okay let's move forward colon cancer now colon cancer begins at the age of 50 the screening time that is and the ideal method is colonoscopy every 10 years of age so every time they would give you the either the choice to choose between the ideal screening test it is always colonoscopy or they will give you uh, a question stem they will most likely include the colonoscopy in there and it is done every 10 years of age so one thing that it is begins at 50 and it ends at 75 so ideally the person is not having more than two colonoscopies if they are normal but if there are other tests for example ct colonography this is done every 5 years and the immunofluorescence the fecal immunofluorescence test and the fecal occult blood test this is done every 1 year not something that they would test not something very good for a screening method ct colonography still when there are for example some contraindications for colonoscopy you can still go for ct colonography and there is another method that is not mentioned here but that it is the sigmoidoscopy that is also done 5 years but if you have got colonoscopy option available you usually go for that but sometimes they would give you in the question stem they would not give you colonoscopy they would give you something else and the frequency there needs to be remembered because unless you know the frequency you will not know whether to repeat that particular test or not this is how all of these screening questions will appear they will give you that frequency that the last test was done at this particular time and you would need to know whether the test needs to be repeated or not now what are the some of the situations for colon cancer just like i'm included the ones for cervical cancer we need to know what are the 
other things that we need to know about colon cancer. So, for example, if there is a history of family, a family history that is positive for colon cancer, we start screening earlier. Obviously, that makes sense to everybody, but the screening age needs to be remembered. It needs to be 40 years or 10 years younger than the age of the colon cancer in the relative. And whichever age is younger, for example, if the age of the colon cancer in the relative was 35, then we begin at 35, we do not begin at 40. But if the age was 45, then we begin at 40. The younger age is taken. And what is meant by family history being positive? It is defined by a single one degree relative with the cancer less than 60 years of age, the colon cancer that is, or two first degree relatives with colon cancer at any age that indicates a positive family history. There's a special circumstance of inflammatory bowel disease. We should know that it can lead to cancer, right? Because it is a chronic inflammatory state. So something that they test upon is that they will ask you once a patient has been diagnosed with IBD, eight years after that, you need to begin the colonoscopy and you need to also reduce the frequency in this scenario because this is not, normal, not a normal scenario. It is two to three year frequency. Okay. Then with adenomas, the frequency increases slightly. And this needs to be separately remembered. There needs to be a three to five year frequency. This is not true for hyperplastic polyps, only for adenomas. Hyperplastic polyps, they would often like you to know that it does not change your screening method. So if someone has got a, a hyperplastic polyp, they will need to have normal re screening resume, uh, resume. But if there are adenomas, then that frequency needs to drop. Finally, for familiar adenomatous polyposis, you begin at 10 years, you do it annually. It is a very high risk condition, obviously, needing eventually colectomy. Man, in HNPPC, the HNPCC, we do go, go for 20 to 25 years beginning, again, annual screening. So these are numbers that 1D does need to remember. And obviously, it may seem volatile at one stage, but eventually you go around these so many times that it gets memorized. Now, breast cancer, finally, we have the age bracket of 50 to 75, a common age bracket with the colon cancer normally, 50 to 75 is this as well. So breast cancer is done, uh, again, obviously in women only for screening purposes and the two-year mammography interval. It is very simple to remember. Probably one of the easiest cancers to remember in terms of screening. So it's a mammography every two years and every time they would... Uh, give you a last mammogram and they would tell you it is one one year back 1.5 years back and they would like you to know whether you would go for it again or not so two year frequency nothing nothing changes in this so it's simple as that and that's it that's it from a presentation i don't think anything else is left two other conditions that i would like you to know about is that one is intimate partner violence those in adults are is are a routine indication. You routinely screen for intimate partner violence in all women of reproductive age. This is something that they test. This is something that I did not include in my presentation, but one condition you should know is tested in every individual that who is of reproductive age, every woman who is of reproductive age, you test for IPV. So they will give you a very simple scenario with everything normal and they would like you to know if you want to do something about it and you would not see any indication there for intimate partner violence but it does indicate uh, the need to screen for intimate partner violence just because the incidence is so high secondly there is a condition for adolescence and although the presentation was not about adolescence but this is something that is very common with the ipv scene so that is adolescents getting screened for depression so adolescents need to be screened for depression regardless of any risk factor so these are two age groups and their routine screening that one does might not think that may be appropriate, but they, they are appropriate according to the guidelines. So this is something that they test both of these conditions. I think that is it. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I would be taking any questions that anybody has. If anybody has got any questions, they can just open their mic and ask, or they can type in the chat. Thank you so much, Navera. If there is anything I was unclear about or any particular guideline that is still confusing, then uh, you can ask that again too. Um, hello, Shazeb. This is Maheen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. 
All right. So this is very informative and um, I got to learn a lot of things that I didn't otherwise. And I hope that we have like similar presentations in future too. Um, however, unfortunately, I missed a few of the slides in the beginning since I joined a bit late. So could you briefly just like um, go over the topics mainly? Like just the topics. Okay. Uh, Okay, so basically that one thing I forgot to mention, thank you for mentioning it, Mahin, uh, that this presentation will be shared with all of you guys, not in the form of slides, but in the form of a PDF that we have built. So it is all the same content. So it will be shared okay. with everybody. All right, thank you. Um, There's one more question. I mm -hmm. don't know this in the beginning, but uh, what about the abdominal aortic aneurysm? Because um, this question also pops up on the world sometimes. Like we have to perform screening for men who have history of smoking and hypertension, and like uh, like they're between the age of sixty five and hmm. so like um, could you touch upon that? Yes. Or okay. So I'm okay. So that. no, no, that's fine. Okay. So firstly, that's they fine. will give you a common scenario, detailed scenario that will include a lot of things. For example, they could include hypertension, which is a risk factor. But the main thing that one needs to remember for screening purposes, that what you need to look for when you're deciding on that particular test, abdominal ultrasound, you need to just look at the fact that the person has been a male smoker at any point in their life. For example, it could be someone who started smoking at the age of 20. He quit at the age of 22. Any kind of smoking history, right? But they're, if they're over 65, they're between the age bracket of 65 to 75, they will need to be get tested. They will need to get tested on. Uh, through an ultrasound for the abdominal aortic aneurysm. So this is why we use the term ever smokers. Like it needs to be somebody who has ever smoked in their life, does not need to be a continuous smoker. So this is what they would ask. Other than that, they can give hypertension, they can give other scenarios, they can give an indication that the person might have a need, they can give a family history. But this for screening purpose, what you need to look at is the smoking status and uh, whether they have ever smoked. But for a woman of the same age bracket of a very long smoking history, regardless of anything, you will not routinely uh, do an abdominal ultrasound. It is not in the guidelines that you test those women. So they can confuse you with this particular thing. That they can give you a woman with the same age group and they can give you a very strong smoking history, not even an ever smoker, but a very strong smoking history, but they will not want you to mark that. So that is not the answer for women. It is only for ma males. So I hope that answers the question. Um, yes, um, that was very clear, and thank you for answering that for me. Um, hmm. Like, just follow up question on that, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, basically, uh, you said uh, you use the term "ever smoker," right? So, hmm. I to ask, um, is there um, a specific, like, um, a history of smoking? Like, for example, if they're supposed to be pack smokers, or just like occasional smoking, also counts for that. Okay, so no. So basically, there needs to be no specific condition. Occasional smokers, pack smokers, any kind of smoking history. And mostly, they will not give you somebody who has like occasionally smoking for like two days or three days or a month. They would not give you that. They would give you someone with some packs, some pack history, but like not for very long. And they would have quit for ages. They would have quit for 30 to 40 years of age. But still, it is still going to be a screening indicated. So there's no specific cutoff given in the guidelines per se that how much do they need to smoke for them to get tested. They just need to be ever smokers. So that's all you need to look for. Right. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. So we have, I think, a couple of questions in the... Okay, we, we can oh, about the HIV and Hep C. So, okay, so what I told about HIV and Hepatitis C is that there is a, a theory that I like to preach about step two CKs that there are lots of conditions where you will find similarities and you you will find differences between two, two conditions. So whenever you have got such conditions where you have got similarities or differences and you try to remember the similarity or difference between them, the fact to remember about them gets easier to memorize. It is something that just, just works on human psychology. So with HIV and hepatitis C, they both have this common indication of routine screening once in lifetime for both males and females between the ages of 18 to 79 years of age. So once you remember that this is common between the two conditions, you can remember the fact easier. You are covering two conditions at the same time and uh, this will help. So anytime you face such similarities, it will come countless of times in step two. 
I myself had a lot of similarities piled up for me that this is how I'll remember this, this is how I'll remember this. And there are lots of differences as well. For example, I told you the difference about lung cancer and about abdominal aortic aneurysm on how lung cancer needs to have a recent smoking status within the last 15 years rather than ever smoking history. So there needs to be differences memorized and there needs to be similarities memorized. Once once get that simple thing, there will be a lot of volatile stuff that will be covered easily. So try to look for similarities and differences in everything that you read. It will help. Any other questions for anyone? I think that is it. No. Uh, so I asked about the adolescent question and now uh, did you reply? With, uh, Which question? Which uh, question? Adolescent, adolescent depression man, the most huh, like, oh, they will eight, 13 to 19 years of age. 12 to 19 or 13 and, to 19, just confirm that. But and it the is symptoms are normally the same. Uh, they will not give you any symptoms. They will not give you. I'm telling you about the routine screening. For example, if somebody is presenting with symptoms, that means you are being asked about a diagnosis and a clinical presentation. It is not about a clinical presentation, it's about a screening, screening an individual for a condition that might exist, regardless of any symptoms. So if an adolescent walks into your office at 15 years of age, having a very normal lifestyle. And they would ask you, what do you test them for? And they would give you an option okay. that no, no testing is indicated. They would definitely give that option. Whenever they have got normal yeah. case scenarios, they do give out that option. No testing is indicated. But you do screen for depression in those individuals. And the similarity I pointed out was with intimate partner violence. Yeah. That is screened for in every reproductive age woman. Now, how will they give it? They will give you a reproductive age woman. They will give you that she has got no low mood, no signs of violence, a very happy lifestyle, a very good fa settled family life. But you will still need to screen for IPV, even if she is not presenting with the risk factors. So those are two routine screenings. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So thank you everybody for your questions and for your responses. I am really glad that you all enjoyed it and you all had benefit from it. And I think that will be the end of the question answer session as well, because the questions have uh, uh, stopped. So thank you again. And I'll be sharing those guidelines with you very soon, the whole presentation in the form of a PDF. And uh, also, you can be very rest assured that these are very complete. So if one does not have the time hassle to go through UWorld again or Amboss again or uh, the white board companion that I suggested, this will have all the information that you need about screening. So uh, you can go through this as well.